All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Live in the Shop with Custom Loads. Today, this is part two of our curved subwoofer box build. We've already got the main structure of the enclosure built. I did say normally, well, if you watch part one, I did say I normally don't do fiberglass in there, but if you did watch, you also seen that I had a little more flex than I guess you could say I would like. So I did add some fiberglass reinforcement to it. We're going to jump back to getting our window brace in there, getting our baffle figured out. We got some sub holes to cut before, you know, while we're waiting for this fiberglass to dry. I'm still getting stream set up, so if you guys are viewing, let me know who is in here and chat. Got a few things to set up real quick. And this box that we're working on is for four Scar Audio ZVX-8s. We're going to be doing a bed liner finish on the outside, so we'll probably even come back with a part three to this and uh, do that part as well. If you guys are just tuning in, drop me a comment. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me know who is in here. Alright, hopefully I can get this slow computer to load up anytime soon. <clears throat> With YouTube, it lets me, you know, set my stream time and I can kind of just start streaming whenever. And uh, Facebook, you have to be within 10 minutes of the window you set yourself. So, I was trying to get the fiberglass laid down in this box before we started, just so we could avoid uh, that boring part. All right, so hopefully that'll load up for me eventually. We're not going to wait on it. We're just going to get started here. All right, so like I said, we're working on a box for four Scar Audio ZVX-8. We already have the main structure of the enclosure, as you guys can see, basically done. I'm waiting on some fiberglass to dry inside that uh, curb section, some fiberglass resin and uh, mat to dry. We already cut the window brace. We got it right here. So, I mean, really, we can't even put that in until the fiberglass dries. I'd rather just wait for that. So we're going to start figuring out our baffle. All right. So we got a double baffle here. We're going to do one layer of flush mount and uh, one, you know, mounting layer. We got both our baffles right here. Again, like I said, in... Part one, we already had all the parts cut, basically. This box is getting bed liner on the outside. So the shown side doesn't really matter as much. All right, so stack these together. Make sure they're square. I'm going to get my nail gun plugged in. Or I guess the compressor going. These are just temporary, you know, tacks to hold it in place, the two layers. I'm going to get my circle jig. We're going to start cutting out the, um, the circles. And I'm going to keep it in two separate layers for now because I want to be able to take them apart and then re-glue them back together once I cut out my flush mount. But I want to cut them together so I know that my center point is as precise as it can be. Okay, so I'm going to grab my circle jig. I gotta get a few things ready to go. And if you guys are curious, as you know, basic little tutorial on curving, make sure you go check out part one of this. 
I went over the whole curfing process and kind of explained even briefly about how I do everything. If you guys want a super in-depth tutorial, though, I have one up on my YouTube. Um, just go look up custom lows on YouTube, and I have a two-part video series uh, explaining the curve, giving a tutorial, showing different size radiuses, all that good stuff. So I'm getting my spiral cut bit on the router right now. So I can get my circle jig over here. All right, got my circle jig on the plunge router base. I'm gonna set that to the side for now. So we're gonna get our center points. Now I already pre-designed this on Google SketchUp, so I'm gonna go directly off um, the center points I figured out here already. So I got the design pulled up on the screen right there. You guys probably can't see, you know, see it in super high definition, but you can at least see what I'm doing on the computer over here. So I'm basically right clicking all these circles, getting the center points of them. And then I'm going to use my dimension tool and uh, from my corners to my center points, pull my dimensions so I know exactly where to put my subs at. one more okay so now we know for the far side subs we got to go six inches over so I'm gonna get my combo square and I'm gonna set it to six inches all right so six inches and then I'm basically just gonna take this and drag it down the side of it to get my line of six inches and then it is, oh, you know what? I did that wrong. Dang it. Damn it. Okay. Six inches should have been across the bottom. Yeah. Oops. That's okay. Nobody but everybody seen me make that mistake. All right. So six inches across the bottom, seven and nine sixteenths across the front. We're going to circle our center point. We have another one. Another sub on the other side, there's four subs in this situation. It's 11 and 5 sixteenths over from the side. I'm gonna mark that out, circle that. And then we know our next sub hole is 18 inches up from the bottom. So we'll mark 18, go over 11 and 5 sixteenths, mark that out. And then we got our center point, circle that so we know which one it is. Next one is seven and nine sixteenths over, 18 inches up. So we'll go ahead and mark 18 inches up. Seven and nine sixteenths over. Circle that center point there. All right, so I'm gonna get some clamps, clamp this piece down. Don't want it to move when you're routering it. Thankfully with the circle jig, if you do have some movement, it's not going to really throw you off too bad, but it just really helps when you have your workpiece secured properly. I'd say I got my drill holding this thing up. Maybe we can wedge that under there. Okay, there we go. All right. So we're about to start drilling our sub holes out here. Get you guys a closer look at what's going on. There's our baffle here. It's a double baffle. We're going to do one layer of flush mount, one layer of mounting. We got all our center points marked out already. Basically, it's going to start, pick one, start there. This is an eighth inch drill bit. It's the same size as the centering pin. I just find it easier to use the drill bit itself as the centering pin instead of drilling the hole out, knocking the centering pin in there, kind of taking a step away. 
Uh, let me pull my design up here. I have some dimensions written down. I do all my designs by hand first and then transfer them to the computer afterwards. Okay, so we know we have, oh geez, almost lost the box. Quick catch. Too bad you guys didn't see it. All right, now well, we're back over here. All right, so our inner dimension is seven and a half and our out OD is eight and 8.65, which is about a little bit bigger than five eighths. So we're gonna make it eight and three quarter, just so we know the subs are for sure gonna fit in there. A lot of times the sub manufacturers, they're a little off on their, uh, their outside diameters because of the gaskets for whatever reason. I don't know if they just can't measure them right or they just choose not to, I guess. All right, so we're going to cut our flush mount first. I'm going to set my depth over here. I'm going to go to where the two plies meet and set it about three quarters. I'm going to go a tiny bit deeper just so I know it for sure cuts through. Lock my depth in. We're ready to go there. And then set this thing at eight and three quarters since that's our outside diameter of the sub for the flush mount. Oh, that's eight and 11 sixteenths. Eight and three quarters. There we go. Eight three quarters. Got to move this clamp over. All right. So you will see me not make this cut in you know two passes, three passes. I might do four or five passes. I like to take it easy on my routers. This thing has lasted me, I don't know, five years, and I'd hopefully like it to last me another five. I've had to rig it throughout time and as you see once I plug it in you know there's no switch on this thing anymore but the motor overall works good so when I make cuts I like to go in gradual steps just to try to save my router but it's also going to save you bits too um, yes you can go through three quarters in one pass but me personally I think it's going to help my tool and my bits last a lot longer if I take it in more gradual steps I probably take a quarter inch at a time All right, so we're going to double check. We got it at eight and three quarters. That looks good. I'm sinking some nails in there because I don't want my first layer to spin on top of my layer once I cut through it. Alright, where was that? Alright, so there's our flush mount. We're going to cut it one more time to make sure we're all the way through. There we go on that. So there's our clutch now, and then we're going to set it to seven and a half to cut out our, actually, you know what? I'm going to do all the flush mounts first, so I don't have to reset my, um, my depth on the router itself. Pull that drill bit out of there. Set it up again. Move the clamp over. All right, and again, we're going to set it at eight and three quarters because we're doing the flush mount. Double confirm at eight three quarters. Perfect.
Now I'm, que now I'm questioning things myself. I just want to double check one thing real quick. It seems like that sub is kind of close to that side. Well, I want to make sure it's not going to interfere with my port. Oh, we're way good. I, it looked a lot bigger than it is. That kerf on the port gives the port just a much bigger appearance. I think I can make this work still. Should be okay. I'm gonna go ahead and do these now so I don't forget them. There we go. I want to retain this piece in there so the router's not just floating over an open space. It kind of gives you more for the the base to rest on. A little more stable uh, cutting surface. So we got two more flush mounts to do. Set it to eight and three quarters again. Well, that's not eight and three quarters. Eight and three quarters. Confirm it. All right. Good to go. Set it to eight and three quarters again. Eight, three quarters, perfect. I'm going to continue to keep it right there, and we're going to do the full cut through. So I'm going to set this to seven and a half because that's our inside diameter. Again, this is a box for Ford Star Audio ZVX8. If you guys are just tuning in, let me know where you're watching from in the comments or who's watching, I guess you could say.
There's one. Oh, and I know that's going to blow dust all over me. Set it back to seven and a half again for our inside diameter. This clamp over. Set this thing back to seven and a half again. All right. Back to seven and a half again. Right there. Oh, so much better. That's the last one. Sweet. Looks good. All right, we're going to take it over to the router, though, and do some uh, a little bit of router work on the flush mount. I kind of want to put a, a chamfer on it, I guess you could say. Ugh. I'm going to get this bay door open and the exhaust fan going. It's getting dusty in here already. You guys are just tuning in we're working on a enclosure for four scar audio zvx 8 it's got a curved port on it we're working on the baffle right now we already got the the structure of the box built in part one we got the curve done 
we did a brief explanation of how to do the kerf in part one as well if you guys are interested in checking that out all right let me get these fans on get some of this dust pulling out of this shop Much better. Much better. Jerry, what is up, man? Thank you for tuning in. Good morning. Tuning in from PA. Thank you so much. Kimron, tuning in from Granada in the Caribbean. Thank you so much for tuning in, man. All right. So this is done. We're going to throw these pieces away. In all my time, I've yet to find an actual good use to have these to keep up, keep taking up room in my shop. Dale Yoder, what's up, man, from Columbus, Ohio? Thank you so much for tuning in. All right, so we got our sub holes cut. We got our flush mount cut. We can put the router away now. Got a few more steps on this baffle until it's done. We're going to also router in some detail on the top part of it in the flush mount. I have a chamfer bit. I'm going to run across the top of it. I think it'll make it make a nice detail on there. If you guys haven't already, make sure you like this video. Share it out there. If you guys are on Facebook, share it to a couple groups if you can. That would be greatly appreciated. If you're on YouTube, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you're not already all right so getting the router set up so I can bring you guys over here all right so I nailed these pieces together to cut them out just because I wanted to make sure that uh, the holes were exactly on top of one another. So this is going to be my port side. This is obviously the top of my baffle facing up with the flush mount. Hopefully my coffee didn't get too dusty. Ah, a little sawdust, I guess, never. Hopefully never killed anybody. All right, so... One thing I'm going to do before I take my pieces apart, and this is just to ensure I put the pieces back exactly the way they were put together when I initially cut the holes out, is I'm going to draw some lines across both of them. Just some pencil marks so you know exactly where those pieces met up with one another. You could label them too. I'll even throw an arrow so I know which direction it's facing up. And uh, that'll help me kind of remember exactly how these pieces were lined up before I take them apart. Because I do a flush mount that is pretty close to a perfect fit, you, you really have to make sure that your mounting hole is lined up properly with your flush mount hole, or the sub's really just not going to fit in very well. All right, so got that off of there. We're going to pull these nails out of here. All right, I'm also going to mark, mark it with an F for face as well, just so I don't get anything confused as I'm working. I'm going to try to pronounce your name without horribly butch butchering it. Ochun? Hopefully I said that right. Tuning in from Miami, Florida. Thank you for tuning in, man. I appreciate you viewing. I hope... I did not butcher your name. I am freaking horrible when it comes to pronouncing names. Okay, so we got our flush mount here. I'm going to drag this over there to the router. Well, carry it over to the router table. And then we'll move the camera. We'll get our router bit set up. And we'll show you guys what we got going on here. Again, for those of you turn who are just tuning in, this is a box for four Scar Audio ZBX8s. Let's see. All right. We're going to drag you guys over to the router table. I 
I got it correct. Sick. Hey, I guess I'm not as bad as I as I thought once in a while. All right, so here we are at the router table. We're going to be putting a large chamfer bit on it. This one I have here from Diablo Freud. Freud Diablo, I guess you could say. So I'm going to raise my bit up. Now, the, I'm using the Craig router lift, um, and it comes with a starting pin, and I kind of just like to use that to take on and off my bits instead of trying to hold, you know, the two wrenches and smash your hands together. It makes it a lot easier for sure. So we had the flush trim bit on there, which we were using yesterday to uh, cut out the window brace. Again, this is a part two of a multiple part series on this thing. So if you guys want to check out the first part we did, make sure you go check out part one. I showed the kerf off. We did the window brace. We built most of the box. A whole bunch of fun stuff happened there. All right, so this is a fairly big bit. We're going to take, again, everything I do with my routers, I like to try to take down. Oop, watch that thing fly off there. Take down in increments. Just going to try to just gonna save your bit, save your router, all of the above. Make sure this thing's real tight in there. This thing is way too big to for me to want it to fly out. All right, so I'm going to lower the bit down pretty low. Now I have my face, where do I help? Where the hell do I put this drill at? Right here. Okay. I have the face marked out. We're going to put the face down on the router table itself. I'm going to kind of eyeball where I want to set this first. Again, I'm going to take it down in progressions so I can take a little bit off just to see where we're started. All right, we're going to start with that. So I'm going to turn the vacuum on. Turn the router on. Vacuum off. That thing is loud as loud as loud as heck. I'm trying to avoid cussing, getting demonetized on YouTube, man. Terrible. This happens very quickly. All right, vacuum on, router on. bigger though so we're gonna hopefully you guys can get a good idea of that detail on there all right this will probably be the last time we raise it because we're gonna start running out of flat material inside the circle to run the bearing on and that's basically gonna be your limitation That's it. That's about as much as I feel comfortable with going for it. The router bit might actually start digging into it. If you have it so high that just the very base of the router bearing is riding the material, it sometimes will tend to eat into the material because it's it's so little and the, bear, the bearing is spinning so fast, it just eats right into it. Oh. Back on router. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
customized, just so you guys can see the difference between this time and last. This is the, the pass we just did, this is the last pass. So it's taking quite a bit more material off this time. is much nicer for sure so this is going to be our flush mount now it's going to go around our subs give it a nice little detail we're going to bring this back over to the assembly table and then i'm going to drag you guys back over here thank you so much man looking nice and it's not even done yes i do agree with you Take a sip of my coffee for this start. Starts getting cold. LurchCon, what's up, man? Thank you so much for tuning in. It said looks great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, we're going to take you guys back over to the assembly area. Let me know who's in here, who's watching. It's an early morning. We're already in the shop building stuff. Uh, I always like to get in here as early as I can. All right, so. I guess this will be a good view. Nice, okay. 418 Lightning, what's up, man? 1728, I appreciate you tuning in, man. All right, where is the charger? Got to find that thing now. The struggles of streaming on an iPhone. <laughs> Although that's like a really petty thing to complain about. Poor me having difficulties live streaming on my iPhone in my car audio fabrication shop. Sometimes I'll be complaining about the dumbest things. I guess it's hard to put it in perspective, you know, because really, like, we're so used now to having things so quickly on demand. I mean, even even as simple as an internet connection running slow, you're like, I know this can run faster. Why isn't it? LurchCon, you said, I just finished my box build. Holy shit, there's so much work to this shit when you aren't a, cat or a carpenter. Yes, for sure. Um, did you figure out the table saw smoking situation? Um, yeah, the table saw smokes when I'm cutting 45s that large. Uh, that's just really the blade, like, heating the wood up so much that it's burning it. Uh, the breaker trips purely because I work in a rat hole of a shop. And uh, the, elect the electrical here is just, like, really shitty. It's, it's not, a, not good enough for a saw of this size. Um, I probably had my compressor kick on my little 29 gallon, uh, compressor kick on and that's what probably popped it. I'm going to be upgrading eventually to a new building. So I'm not, I'm not even going to worry about it too much, honestly, at this point. Thank you for asking though. Fusion, what's up, man? Thank you so much for tuning in. If I didn't already welcome you. All right, guys, so we're going to start working on the main structure. Not the main structure, I guess. We're going to start working on putting the window brace inside the box. Inside the, the box, yep. Lurishcon, you said rat holes work better than the Vegas backyards. Hey, man, I, I'm from Vegas, and I, I don't ever remember it raining. So you could probably work out. You could probably work in the backyard in Vegas um 360 
days of the year. You might have a couple. I mean, dude, I don't even remember it raining more than a couple times in in the years that I lived there. Totally. Obviously, it's hot as as hell, but I don't have AC myself. So, hey, we're we're uh, we're both dealing with the heat for sure. And I think I want to say Vegas is definitely colder during the winter time and fall time than Florida is. If you guys are just tuning in, we're working on an enclosure for four Scar Audio ZVX 8s. Fair enough, but I still wish I had a shop. Oh, no doubt, bro. I mean, hey, rat hole or not, dude, I I am uh, I'm grateful to have what I have here. And this shop is, it's, it's really not that bad, honestly. It's got enough space for me to get what I need done. The electrical is only crappy enough to give me a headache every once in a while or... I don't know. It all depends. Sometimes it'll it'll do that three, four times a day, and that's when it's really frustrating. But we're gonna make it work until we can do do better. I think the big bonus to a shop is if you're in the middle of a project, you can leave everything out and uh, walk away. I know when I used to work, like on my back porch and stuff, or at my old cabinet shop, my boss's shop, you get done with the project, you got to do an hour of cleanup because you can't leave the, you can't either leave your back porch like that or you can't leave the boss's shop like that because uh, you'll get yelled at for it for sure. Or I mean, I, I know I would have leaving it like that. Yeah, I just seen a Facebook post that like was a memory, I want to say five, six years ago, it was like my first actual official shop and I say this place is a rat hole, dude. This place looks like a, uh, the Ritz Carlton compared to that first shop, man. That place was was gross. I mean, it literally didn't have electrical in like in the building. I was running extension cords from my from my buddy's shop to uh, to mine. It was it was pretty wild. But hey, you make it work when you love doing what you're doing and you're trying to. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about the struggle now. I'm worried about the end goal and end result, I guess you could say. Silly question. Okay, Lurch Connie said, silly question. For an enclosure that size, why 8-inch subs? And when these subs become popular, on Tell Your Channel, I had zero clue they existed. Sorry for asking all the questions here. Hey, dude, ask questions all day long. Ask as many as you want. The comments alone greatly help the stream, so hey, I don't mind asking questions. It gives me something to talk about as well while we're streaming and I'm building. Um, honestly, I couldn't say. The customer ordered this off my website, and um, the way I have my websites set up when I was selling enclosures of this nature is basically just a drop-down menu set up where they can select what they want, um, select their you know, finishes, and pay right there. And I really didn't, you know, I really... Most of the time, don't consult with the customer on their sub selection. Most of the time, people come to me with what they want. Unless they're, they're trying to get something that I think is not going to work, that's probably the only time I'm going to bring it up. But, hey, you already have four eights. It's unique, too, I think, also. Like, you know, the general public doesn't have eights. So, you know, this guy is going to go around bumping four eights. It's going to be, you know, so loud people are going to be asking what's in it. And I think just the, the kind of, you know, shock value for the everyday person is going to be you know, pretty cool when it's four eight inch subwoofers. Oh no. I wanted to touch that fiberglass, see if it was dry and it was uh it was not. So now my fingers are sticky with fiberglass resin. Let me try to now I gotta fix the piece I moved too. Alright. Sundown 8s that did a 150, that sniper box, I think. Oh, I, he did more than a 150, dude. Um, man, I have him on Facebook. He's my friend on Facebook. I should know his name. Uh, geez, man. I'll, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out his name. But I, I watch his builds, and I follow him actually pretty closely on those 8-inch builds he does. They're, they're pretty amazing, man. I mean, I think even... Even Sundown was so impressed. They, uh, I think they got slightly involved in his his little projects he had going on. 
I don't want to say little projects, and I'm not demeaning them by any way. Hopefully, you guys don't think that. Um, man, I'm trying to think of his name. I'm drawing a total, a total blank right now for some reason. Either way, yeah, uh, I want to say he did better than a 150 for sure in the sniper box. He's done a couple different revisions, and I know he was even 3D printing some subwoofer parts, like totally custom, custom stuff. This guy was getting involved in to make these eights loud. But yeah, it's just, it's cool, man. It has that wow factor of like, wow, eights, eights can get that. Yeah, Ronnie Smith, there you go. Eights can get that loud. I have to work under just a carport. Uh, 418 Lightning said, yeah, hey. You, you got, you make, you make it work when you can, I guess, you know? Oh, God. Uh, you said he made it to a 155. I believe you're correct, honestly. I I know it was, like, freakishly loud. It might have even been louder than that, dude. I. It's uh, nothing short of record-breaking. I know that much for sure. So, hey, hats off to Ronnie Smith, dude. He did, he did some amazing work getting those eights as loud as he did. You know, you'd almost wish that he would, like, commercially sell the design, but then again, it would kind of... If everyone was doing it, it would, wouldn't be nearly as special, you know? get this thing over here Blah. you guys can see the fiberglass reinforcement i did in there the other night or not the other night this morning actually i did it um mask 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 there it is it's always hanging somewhere between him and mbe that's all you hear about i i, I guess what the eight inch woofers or the scores they did. All right, so I'm gonna. I gotta sand a little bit of this fiberglass. I'm gonna wear my mask. Always wear a mask when doing sanding fiberglass. Uh, you asked, uh, do you think one ZV615 will be loud enough? I mean, that's, that's a very vague question. Loud enough for what? Loud enough for who? Um, you know, what, what's your goal? I guess you could say, like, are you, are you trying to do 160s? You know, a single sub might not be enough. I mean, obviously, yes, people have done it, but. In a regular case, I mean, I think I'd be plenty happy with it. A ZV615, dude, in a ported box, that's definitely, I, I would almost say guaranteed to get loud. It's its going to be a loud setup for sure. You really couldn't even debate that. 
you're going to go two eights, but you got the ZV6. Oh, that's, yeah, the 115 over the two eights, you're definitely going to be louder with the 115. In, in my opinion, as long as you do the right design, you build it right. Not just enjoy good bass just for me, but I want it to be loud for me to enjoy. Not just enjoy good bass just for me, but I want it to be loud for me to enjoy. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean. Um, oh, sorry. That's on Facebook, actually. Uh, LurchCon, I'm, I'm streaming both on Facebook and, okay, so you know what? I'll just show the comments here. I should do that. That'll actually put some context. So he asked, do you think one ZV615 will be loud enough? My answer to that is yes, it'll be loud enough. Um, okay, so 418 Lightning. So a big reason to choose small subs. I'm just going to, you know what, I'm going to put it up on the screen, just even if I'm reading it. So a big reason to choose small subs over large subs is mostly airspace required. You can fit more cone area into a smaller space. I wouldn't necessarily say that's true. I'd have to pull up the cone area chart, but like, you know, two eights, two decent eights is comparable to one twelve and how much space it takes. And it's very close to how much space two tens takes as well. So, I mean, if you're going to run two eights, if you had a little more space, you could most likely run two tens for sure. Yeah, sorry guys, I should have I should have put into context that I'm streaming both on Facebook and YouTube right now. Well, I couldn't wait. You were you are building my sub box. You are the mastermind, sick man. Thank you so much for ordering through me. Sorry I didn't recognize your name immediately. Oh yeah, dude. A, a ZV a ZV six fifteen, bro. Is gonna is gonna be loud for sure. Don't even, don't even uh. Don't even stress that. Yeah, I'll try to keep doing that, LurchCon. I know it's probably kind of confusing when I'm just, I'm like talking to you guys, but then replying to random comments on both sides of the stream. I'll start uh, I'll start adding the comments as I go. So if you guys have any comments, questions, feel free to ask me. Again, man, thank you so much for choosing to order through me. I really appreciate it. And we're going to definitely build you a, I keep saying we, I'm going to definitely build you a really loud box, that's for sure. You'll be plenty happy with that ZV615, man. All right, so here's the window brace. I just pried off the last two little pieces I had on there. Uh, 418 Lightning said, but the 8's physical size will fit in more places than a 10-inch will. You, you got me there. You got me there. You could, you could more tightly compact your baffle with cone area, I guess you could say, in, in that, in that um, instance. But I'd have, to, I'd have to really see the cone area chart and kind of design. You know, I think it would really depend on specifically what build you're doing and what design you're doing. Because I know when I, I did my 615s wall, um, I debated between a lot of options. I was going to go 812s, 615s. Um, I think I might have even considered 1210s. Uh, there's just so many different things that you can get on the baffle. And uh, you gotta, there's a lot of things to consider when you're doing that. All right, so let's pull my Google, Google SketchUp design up. I got to see where the window brace falls in here. It's a good thing about, you know, pre-designing things is you don't have to go back and uh, guess later on. All right, so 11 and 5 sixteenths. 11 and 5 sixteenths. Okay, so 14 and 3 sixteenths. All right. We're going to see how this works. Where did I put that damn thing at? Here it is. All right. So although I did design it and rendered it out, I'm still going to double check it just because 
you don't want to build it and then realize, or secure it in there, then realize like, oh man, this ain't going to fit now. Or the sub's going to hit the window brace or something. Okay, cool. Sweet. All right. Lurch Khan, you said, I think you told, I think I told you that I called kicker with all my specs for the four eight inch kickers and they gave me the port size and dimensions for a tune of 40 hertz. Under the seat, 2021 Sierra, I had roughly 11 and a quarter front seat to floor. Um, yeah, the kickers, they recommend a higher tuning. You can, I personally believe you could probably tune it a little bit lower to help the subs a little bit more in the low end. But, um, if you're unsure about those things, if you guys are just getting started, I would say factory recommendations are probably a good place to start. You know, Kicker definitely does their testing to, uh, they're not just telling you 40 hertz for no reason, you know. But in an underseat specifically, I would try to tune a little lower because it's already going to have a hard time playing, not a hard time, but a more difficult time playing the low end stuff as is. So the lower tuning of the enclosure should help that a bit. There's going to be limits to that as well, though. Uh, 418 Lightning, you said, personally, I'd always go as big as I could for a given amount of space. And then you said, that sounds like a rock tuned box. Um, I'm, I'm going to, okay, so I showed that comment and I'm just showing them just to give you guys context of what I'm actually reading. I would say the comment is a little bit incorrect. Um, saying something is tuned for rock, I think it's probably the wrong way to go about describing a higher tuning. Um, you know, not specifically rock, but like, I know a lot of like bands, like their breakdowns, like dig really, really low. So. I mean, I'd, I'd almost dare to say 20 hertz-ish hertz hertz -ish range. So to say a higher tuning is a rock tuning isn't necessarily right. I mean, even the kick drum, the bass drum, that's going to be lower. Ba Actually, the kick drum might be higher bass, but like the bass guitar, I believe that's going to that's gonna play um, sub-frequencies. Although I know, you know, 20 to 80 is technically a sub-frequency, but, you know, when I say sub-frequency, I'm more so talking lower lower 30s, um, 20s, stuff like that. Lurch Khan, you said, I was really unsure of tuning. Yeah, if you're unsure of the tuning, man, um, well, like I said, Kicker, they know what the hell they're talking about, so I don't think they're going to tell you something uh, that is incorrect. But again, you know, they're also telling you that because the sub has certain mechanical limitations. And, you know, when you're instructing a customer who you have to assume their knowledge, you know, most of the times when you're instructing a customer, you almost have to assume their knowledge is at level zero. So you really want to instruct them in the safest manner you can. I'm not sure why Kicker suggests what they suggest. I've never really looked into it too much. I mean, up until just recently, the last video I did with the underseat, I haven't built for a pair of kickers in, dude, forever, forever, forever. It's it's not a very popular sub with my customer line, so I haven't really spent the time to uh, do any deep research into really any of the models. I did have the uh, the three CVX tens enclosure. Um, I'm gonna be building a four L sevens eight or four eight inch L seven under seat enclosure as well. And I think I have one other kicker under seat enclosure. They're getting a little more popular with the under seat stuff, but definitely anything bigger. I don't have a ton of experience with, I mean, I think to memory, I've probably only built three or four boxes for kickers in the history of building subwoofer boxes. I've probably built, you know, a hundred sundown subwoofer boxes, but when it comes to kicker, like three or four.
I think I think that comes down to my price range. Um, not that kicker's not expensive, but you know, it's probably not the price range. It's probably where I'm actually advertising. I don't think it's that people. Oh, okay, here, I'm, you know, I'm gonna pull the comment up here just so people can actually see it. Why so many people don't like kicker? Honestly, I don't know. I think when you have somebody who knows absolutely nothing about car stereos hooking up something, uh, it's likely, I don't want to say likely, it might blow up. They might abuse it with their inexperience. They might hook something up wrong with their inexperience. So I think, or they might blow it. You know, these people who say, oh, my kicker's blue, or back in the day I had some kickers and it, it they blew all the time, so I had to go with something else. You know, maybe they were maybe they had bass boost on ten on their head unit, and and on the amp they had to gain all the way up the bass boost on the amp up. You know, you really got to look at the experience of the users. And Kicker has such a, a nationally known name. Anyone that wants to get into the hobby of car audio, they probably already know about Kicker. So, being that they know about Kicker, they they probably know about Kicker but know little to nothing else about car audio in general. Um, so they're going to go kickers because they've heard of the brand a ton of times, and then probably they're going to misuse it and abuse it, and uh, then they're going to talk trash about kicker because they just didn't know any better. And I think a lot of that, um, a lot of that really is probably why they get some hate. But I don't think you can say that they're a crappy brand by any means. And I think anything that they offer, I mean, they have such a huge name to them, dude. Like, risking their reputation would, they, they wouldn't risk their reputation to put out a subpar product just because, you know, just based on the fact of who they are, you kind of have a, in my opinion, I would ha I have a, uh, a standard assumption and, and when I get a kicker product, I kind of assume that it's going to be within a certain within, within a certain quality, you know. It might not be like something that is really base head, you know, um, approved, but it's still going to be a quality product. But I think that's true about a lot of these brands. Even Tramps, they get a lot of hate as well. But then again, you got to ask yourself, like, you know, are all these amplifier supposed amplifier fires happening from people who are wiring their amps into the absolute dirt on the crappiest electrical they can put and um you know playing them well well after thermal it's just you gotta there's a lot of abuse that probably goes into all of this as well too much all right 418 lightning you said for me it's price and power handling plus if it falls fails you can't just slap a different sub in its place oh with with the kicker subs you're referring to I guess you could say uh, and then Lurch Connie said, Kicker Rank recommended three pounds of polyfill, which confused me. So I figured, try without it first, then later, when I remove the box to finish the outside, add it. What do you think? Um, I see polyfill used in situations where you can't necessarily get as big of, as, as big of an enclosure as you would like. So you're going to use it to kind of manipulate and trick the subs into believing they have a little bit more airspace. One thing I, I have seen... And I'm sure Kicker's done the math on this to know. If you add too much polyfill, it'll actually prematurely heat up your sub. Um, I mean, the product in itself is like inert, I guess you could call it. It doesn't interact with anything. It's just a, f a polyfill. But the air inside of it moving through the weave of the polyfill will actually heat the air up inside the box. If you have too much, it can actually cause issues. But I'd say if Kicker's recommending it, they they know how much to put, how much not to put. But yeah, it's I, I honestly believe it's usually when you have a box that's a little towards the small side and you want to trick the subs into believing they have a slightly bigger enclosure. 
I've done it with sealed boxes, like in fourth orders, I've tried it. I didn't really notice a difference, but that might really be build specific, and that might be more to do with that specific situation than it does the polyfill not working, because I have also seen it work for people as well. I believe it will also help, like, soften the roll-offs and stuff like that, but I can't be... I don't want, I'm not really going to even state that because I'm not 100% sure in all honesty. Oh, man, you see that? The power flickering out. Um, it's not a bad idea. They tend to lean towards the quality sound. All right, so let's see here. Jermaine Crutchfield, enclosure volume question. Savard drops recommended enclosure size by 20% when adding a subwoofer. Will Savard, Will Savard claims it keeps the base output from being muddy. Thoughts? Um, I mean, to, first of all, I would say explain what muddy means. Like what, what does that, what does that even mean? Like, I guess I, I'm not understanding what they're considering muddy base. I'm just going to take this damn clamp off of here. I guess, I guess maybe lose, maybe they're referring to like the loss of, of, um, suspension control that that might be more so what they're referring to versus um, mu muddy I, I don't know that's almost like as bad of a word of a, of a descriptive word as as crisp or um, like sharp base like what I, I don't know I will say when I do it when I add extra subs I add the amount of volume it needs. I will say though, you can definitely get away with at having less in volume. If having less volume, let's say you have four, let's say you have a 10 and it requires one cubic foot of uh, volume for that 10. If I was gonna do a box with two of them, I, I do firmly believe that if you feel it had like 1.75 cubes, you'd probably still be pretty good off. Um, and same thing with I think honestly, though, if I if I could do two cubes in it, I for sure would. But if I had to kind of sacrifice to uh, fit within a customer's space parameters, I would definitely say um, I would still lean towards giving each sub the volume that it actually requires versus reducing it. Now I will definitely reduce the the port. Um, the port area, I'll reduce that by a factor, usually about 50% I start with. Um, but I definitely don't reduce the, the volume size unless something is restricting me within the build's specifications. You know, customers come to me and they say, hey, you know, I got, I got these subs and I got this car and I, I want to fit it in this box. And as long as it's not insane or, you know, is going to be something that's going to sound like ass later on, I'll usually take on the project so I guess with that being said I when and when I can I will always just double the volume but I have definitely found you can reduce it and I'd say 10% is probably conservative like under seat enclosures you know you really run into that situation a lot of times um, you know, most undersea boxes are going to be around 2.7 cubes on the inside underneath like the, the Chevy Silverado. And now four eighths sounds great in that box. But if you did the math, you know, like the X eights, I think sounds really good in the box with 2.7 cubes. But if you did the math, the X's would really want, you know, almost three and a half to four cubes for four subs. Um, and you might think, oh, it's not going to sound good. It doesn't got enough space, but because it's a shared chamber, it definitely, um, you get away with 
running a slightly smaller enclosure. I don't know specifically why, but I just know it works, and I keep I keep repeating it. If it works for me, I just repeat it until it stops working for me. Um, you asked, what is your input on StackFab, Octoport, or Aeroport? Well, I personally think Aeroport is better, but there is going to be situations where you need a custom-sized port. Um, I would prefer to see someone run a StackFab circle port, because if you're going to StackFab, there's no damn reason to not go circle. Um, I see, a lot of times when you see octoports, I think it's because, in my mind, I've used octoports in situations where I, I want to have a round port, or that what's, that's what will fit within the build that I'm doing, but I need it to be slightly bigger than what a round port will provide me, or slightly smaller. You know, if you're stuck, if you're going with big-ass ports, you're kind of stuck with an 8-inch port, a 10-inch port, or a 12-inch port. I'm not even sure if they sell the 10 or the 12 anymore, but I know that's usually what you were stuck with when you went with them. Um, so if you needed a five inch port, the Octo port was a good way to get you that five inches of port area. And it's not going to be five inches of port area. It's going to get you a similar port area that a five inch round port would, but you don't have to stack fab it. And it's a lot easier for, for you to build stack fabbing takes a long time, costs a lot of money to do. So if the customers wanted to do a build, and they wanted to incorporate a round port, or maybe it needed a round port. Stack, you know, the, the octo port is a good way to go, but if you're going to be stack fabbing it, do a circle port. It makes more sense. I have seen the ones that GP has. I'm probably, I'm pretty sure it's probably why you're asking, in my opinion, I think. But that being said, I think they're a cool product. They look really cool, for sure. But if you're going to go through stack fabbing, you might as well stack fab a circle port. It just makes more sense to me. Because the circle is going to be better. All right, so let's see here. Jermaine, you said, Savard says one high Q8 needs 0.7 cubes versus four high Q8s only only requires 1.9 cubes. I, I can't confirm that I've never worked with the Savard woofers, but uh, that sounds about right to me. Uh, LurchCon, what vehicles are you building that kicker box for? The 2021 Sierra Hump. I use a three-quarter MDF each side and a 15-inch piece across the, the hump to the two pieces. Across the hump to the two pieces. Um, what vehicle are you building? I'm building the, the kicker box for four, or sorry, for a 2018 Ford F-150. The L7's box is, I want to say that's a Ford 2, honestly. I have done a ton of Chevy boxes though. If you go look on my YouTube channel, or LurchCon, you're on YouTube. I guess I should, I should pull this comment up again so I can get some context for you guys. Um, if you're on, go on YouTube, check out. I have, I have a couple of builds like that. If you're curious and seeing what I've done, I guess. <laughs> All right, so you said, got it, then most likely you will do a, an arrow or a curve for from that build because it's the space available. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go whatever whatever works the best in that given situation. Um, the Acura TL, I will say, you're going to have a... Um, you're going to have... We'll, we'll figure it out. We, we'll, we'll definitely make something good for you. We're probably going to go with the curve port in that situation we well we're gonna see once we get down to it actually 
watching you live while driving to work. Be careful, man. Don't be... Hopefully you're just listening and driving, not watching and driving. I like that you're watching, but be careful. Roads are dangerous out there, man. All right, we got our window base in. We got the whole box built. Now we're going to start attaching our port, or not the port, attaching our top piece. I'm going to do each layer individually. The first layer, I'm actually going to hide some screws, and I'm going to screw it in place. I'm putting some glue down now, spreading it out with my finger. I'm using tight bond, too, for wood glue. Just my preference. Tight bond one or three will also work. I find the three sets a little too quick for me personally. And uh, the tight bond one sets a little too slow for me. So tight bond two, good, good middle ground, I think. Uh, LurchCon, you said you should sell custom designs on your website. So basically for a DIY person to save money, they give you their dimensions, you give them the design, port size and tuning frequency they will have. I I sell designs on my website actually. If you guys go check out go check out www.customos.com. I got designs on the website. I got a whole bunch on there, man. I think I have a uh, 100 at least at least 100 different designs on there. I guess we should uh, add this banner on there so you guys can get the website. There we go. Uh, Lurch Connie said, lucky for me, Kicker was quick with helping me with port size and tuning. Then having you explain in a video helps it so help solidify they didn't give me a new employee to work with. Yeah, no, I like and like I said, man, they got such a reputation behind them. They're they're probably making sure anyone they have talking on the phone so the general public has has some good knowledge to them. Or probably some training even with how big they are. Hey, I'm glad you're just listening, not watching while you're driving. I've seen most of these, but they didn't match my under seat. Oh, okay, so you've seen most of the videos, but they didn't match my under seat for the kickers is what I mean. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll hopefully soon to have, have done something with the kickers. I'm going to hurry up before my glue dries. If you guys are just tuning in, make sure you drop a comment. Let me know where you're tuning in from, where you're watching at. Or just let me know you're here. We're working on a box for four Scar Audio ZBX-8s right now. We already, this is a part two of a multiple part series. In the part one, we got the kerf cut. We got the box mostly assembled right now. I'm working on getting the tops on. We already cut the sub holes out. We got our flush mount. And our mounting layer, it's a double baffle we're putting on here. Right now I'm just spreading out the glue to get this thing ready to attach. Troy Lawrence, good morning from Raleigh. Damn, they got you in Raleigh now. Man, you ain't. You're always going, 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 bro. Thank you so much for tuning in, man. Hopefully I'm keeping you entertained. Although I'm sure you're probably about to have to start working soon if you're not already. All right, so... Time to get this bath on. It is getting hot in here. I don't know what's up with Florida, man. It just decides to go cold, hot, cold, back to hot, back to cold. Can't decide what temperature it would like to be. All right. 
So we're going to grab our non-flush mount layer and we want to have it facing arrows up. If you remember earlier, we put those little indicator lines on there so we know exactly how to orientate it. Now it might be a little off square. We'll work on getting that all lined up as we go along. Normally what I'll do is I'll start on this port wall here because if you nail this up, you can kind of deflect it to get the other corners to square up for you. Jake, Luke, what's up, man? Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Jake, Luke asked. First of all, I was tuning in from Mississippi. Thank you so much for tuning in, man. Like I said, will you do a tutorial on maybe some eight pillars or doors? Um, maybe, maybe. I When I have some doors coming up, I'll definitely stream them. Um, it's a lot easier for me to stream stuff. Filming tutorials and editing, man, I I don't have the time, man, to be honest with you. It's a, a lot of them, and especially a doors tutorial, that's going to be something that's really in-depth. There are so many steps to getting a proper set of door panels built. Um, all the way from fitting on the vehicle to building them right, uh, sound stage setup. I guess maybe if you if we kind of narrowed it down to something really specific, I could just quickly talk about it on stream and kind of go over it there, that way. Um, I'm definitely not opposed to some sort of tutorial during a live stream, but as far as doing one and kind of editing it up, I, I probably won't have the time for something like that. I've kind of adopted this new live stream um, method just to as many people as I can but also I've learned that I just don't have time to film you know 400 clips and then mash them all together splice them edit them put music to them make them entertaining it's a lot easier for me just to work on the fly talk as I go build 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 when I do have some door panels coming up though man I definitely will um Troy we're gonna be doing his door panels very soon I don't know if I'm gonna be I don't know if I'll necessarily live stream it. It all depends, man. It just depends what mood I'm in today. That day, I guess you could even say. 418 Lightning. You said, uh, can you show us how you make the sawdust glue paste mix to fill your gaps? I do not do that. Um, and I would say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this comment up on here the whole time I'm talking about this. Don't do this. Never do this um glue mixing glue and sawdust together to do wood filler just go buy wood filler they sell the dap um like a large container of dap wood filler wood putty for i don't know nine bucks you can get a lot a little can to say if you were doing a small box like this you can get a little container of it for probably six dollars the amount of uh sandpaper you're going to go through trying to sand through all that glue you pasted onto your box is going to far out, you know, outnumber the cost of uh, just buying the wood filler itself. Do not mix sawdust and wood glue as an attempt to do. What you have, maybe you already have a ton of sandpaper that you're okay with blowing through, but generally, don't do it. I did it one time because someone who was, you know, a box builder, and this is back in the SMD forum days where um, where I literally, you know, I'd go on there and ask questions because I knew nothing. I, I knew nothing at all. So I kind of asked, what wood filler do you guys use? And someone suggested that to me. I tried it. 
I will never do it again. I spent hours sanding, dude. Wood glue is the hardest to sand off anything. Um, ho hopefully you guys hear me. I'm not sure. Can you, can you guys hear me? Um, anyway, oh, two people are saying the mic's out. What do we got going on here? It says my mic's on. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I think it's it's an hour and a half almost into the stream. My phone usually likes to decide um, it's not going to work much longer after that. According to my mic, it's still connected and on, so hopefully it's working a little better for you guys. Let me get a sound check. Can anybody hear me? Please let me know. Um, hopefully you guys heard at least some of the rant that I was going on um, because it was a long one. So hopefully you heard at least any of it. Either way, don't do it. Just don't do it. I can hear you now. Okay, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. TJ Blanding, it's working. Thank you so much for letting me know, guys. All right, well, at least I didn't get really, really far into that rant before I realized nobody could hear me. Yeah, the phone, after uh, after about an hour, hour and a half of streaming, it just says you've streamed long enough, and I'm going to close the Safari now. That's kind of why I adopted the StreamYard thing, because um, it actually lets me keep the stream going if one of them closes. The first couple rounds of lives I did, man, it's like almost like the first four or five of them ended in just the stream dying on my phone, and I couldn't connect it. And then then by that time, you're like everyone's left. You, you probably aren't going to retain anyone, so it's like, okay, well, that was a wash. But I've learned, and I've upgraded some things. Make the streaming a little bit better for you guys. <laughs> okay. I, I put this comment on screen before I even read through it. I probably should be a little more careful with that. He said, yes, sawdust and glue is like taking the ugly girl home for 20 home 20 minutes into the party instead of waiting for the hot girl. I, I'd almost say it's it's worse than that. It's It works, and if you have a whole bunch of sandpaper and you don't have wood filler and maybe you've spent your last dollar on, your pro, on the project and, hey, maybe it's midnight and you don't want to run to Home Depot and you want to get your project finished. I know how that is, but... If, if you have the time to go get the proper materials, get the wood filler. Sawdust and glue sucks. We have saved somebody from a tragedy today, guys. Haven't done it now. I know not to. Well, 418 Lightning, I'm glad we were, I was able to learn you a thing or two on not doing that. Small things like that can make or break a project and also make or break your attitude about the project. Everything's going good until you're sanding for three and a half hours because you wanted to save five bucks. There's, there's still things that I do around here that, you know, I have to eventually kind of think like, well, is it worth the savings or is my time worth more money on a diy project that's not as important but when it comes to the sawdust and glue don't don't do it hopefully you can see how much i hate it i've spent a very long time talking about it 
give it, get, let's get another topic in here. Let's hear about some, some car audio myths you guys have heard. Or maybe you've recently heard. You're still following. You've, you heard when you were new and you're not using it anymore. I know there's a bunch of them that I've had to face. I don't know. Maybe not a bunch, but there's been a few for sure. You get a lot of know-it-alls like myself in the car audio scene that try to tell you how things are done. Where is my countersink bit? Here it is. Impact. There's my drill. Here it is. Sean Barlow. What's up, man? Thank you so much for tuning in. You said the box is looking good. I appreciate that, man. All right, uh, 418 Lightning, you asked, on this box you're building now, why is the port not in the center? Because I fucking hate center ports. Not really. I just don't like them at all. I, nine out of ten times, I would much rather do um, side port every every time if I can. LurchCon, I'm off to bed. I don't know where you live, man, but maybe you like to sleep during the day. See you, buddy. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for the help. Thanks for the inspiration for a whole generation. Us. Hey, man. I, I I hope I am inspiring some of you guys to build some stuff. Thank you for tuning in, man. Hope hope to see you on another live stream very soon. All right, so I'm going to go around countersink some holes in here. I like to hide screws where I can. I do not like to put screws on the outside of enclosures. Well, okay. If it's getting stained, I find it reprehensible to put screws on the outside of the box. It's terrible. You're just bad. It looks terrible. You could wood filler it and it still looks bad because it looks like a circle of wood filler that got stained over. It looks ugly. Please stop doing it, guys. Don't do it anymore. So I usually put screws anywhere I can hide. If it is a bed liner box, I will sometimes add some extra screws in there because I know I can bondo over them and I'll never have to worry about them. But in a situation that the box is getting stained, I will never put screws on the outside where you will see them. Um, okay, Odo R, you said, oh, Auto R, you asked, how does Torres box calculator compare with Win ISD? Personally, I would not even know. Um, well, okay, I guess I know, the, know that Win ISD is a lot more complicated and complex, has a lot more variables that it will consider. Torres box tuner is like the basic of basic box tuners. It's not going to give you any graphs not going to give you any um, plot charts or anything like that, spit out any any sort of info like that. It is purely just a very basic airspace and port tuning calculator. So the difference really is um, the Win, Win ISD is going to be a more complex version. You probably get better, well, I don't even want to say better results. I don't use Win ISD personally. I use Torres Box Tuner to get my basic basic box volume and tuning and then I kind of go off uh, different things I've learned throughout my experience of box building to come up with a good design. I don't think when ISD incorporates the vehicle or different cabin gains that different vehicles are going to have which is in my opinion very important. So I've spent little to no time on it. Closer to no time on it than little time, I'd say. If you guys have any other comments, questions, feel free to ask. If you're just tuning in, we're working on an enclosure for four Scar Audio zbx 8 We're getting towards the end of the building process. This is also going to get a bedliner finish, which we are going to show on the stream. Might not be this episode. We're probably going to come back with a part three. 
we might even come back with a part four depending on what we got going on once i get this baffle attached i'm going around and screwing it right now i already added some glue and brad nails just putting screws where i can hide them inside the enclosure but once i get this thing all built we're going to have some more work around the box doing uh routering getting our final shape basically the final look of the enclosure lightning you said if you've watched bruce exo build a box he can use a ton of screws what's your thought on how many to use or how often um it depends on the situation if you're building an spl build you know kind of like his van build i've been following along i subscribe to him as well did some really cool videos by the way if you guys aren't familiar with who exo is you should definitely go check his channel out um Although I think if you're watching me, you definitely know who EXO is, I'd say. Either way, on the topic of screws, how many to use? Should you use them? In an example of a build like his van build or a loud walled vehicle, even something that maybe has, has a ton of subs, I would say in those situations, screws are going to help as extra security and precaution to make sure nothing breaks apart or flexes really loud builds are, are quite violent they have a you know a lot of vibration a lot of flex a lot of pressure so in cases of big builds i'd say screws yes in cases of small builds um like this i am putting them on the baffle just because i can hide them and when i can add overkill i'm always going to but i do believe and in a lot of circumstances, I would just build this box purely using wood glue and uh, brad nails to hold it together. Wood glue is going to be a very, very strong connection. And it's, it's going to be a good... Um, it's going to be a good bond between your two pieces of wood. It's wood glue. It's, it's literally designed and made to be, you know, to bond two pieces of wood together. That's a good question though. Hopefully that helps answer your question even slightly. All right, I'm going to take a second attempt at pronouncing your name. Ochen asked, uh, when you're building a box, for example, for one ZV615, do the box get more screws and other things for extra strong box? Um, so I'm going to break that down as you're asking, does it get extra screws and bracing to make it a stronger box? Yes, it's all going to depend on the situation, how I'm going to build the box. Um, you will see with me. I always do a double baffle minimum for everything. For your ZV615, I'm going to do a triple baffle for sure. It's an extra, it's a heavy sub. Um, it's going to have the potential to be a little louder than, say, four eights, in my opinion. So I am going to put a little extra bracing, a little extra, I mean, not extra glue, because putting extra glue is really not going to help you, I would say. Once you have enough glue, you're, you're good. But I'm going to put extra bracing to make sure that uh, we're gonna compensate for the fact that the box is going to need to be extra strong. Thomas Hood, 
What's up from Mississippi? Thank you so much. Scraping base. That is a mildly thirsty question. I'm not. I'm, I'm not gonna put. We're not gonna put that on uh, on screen. A strange question. <laughs> Scraping base. Okay. I'm just gonna I'll, to keep it. In, I guess slightly entertaining. Yes. Any ladies watching? Um, I'm gonna say, if there is any woman watching at all, it's gonna be my fiance Chloe. Um, my demographic of, of, of viewers is like 99.9% .9 male. Um, literally. There is like few to no female viewers of my channel. It's car audio. Like, you're, we're, uh, we're mostly a male, you know, group for sure. It's kind of why I also don't feel weird, like, you know, referring to you as guys, because I know, based on my analytics, that uh, almost all of you are guys. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it's all the same. All guys. You, you're the ones who are going to be buying the boxes. You guys are also going to be the ones watching these videos to learn how to DIY a drone box, possibly. It's just the crowd I'm working with. Kind of a strange question, I'd say. Or maybe a, a minor, slightly cringe question. But I, I do appreciate you watching, so no hate, no hate. All right, I'm going to get my flush trim bit set up on my router. Man, it's already starting to get hot. It's only 8.30 in the morning, and it's like already toasty in here. All this damn work I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry, Scraven Base. I assumed you were being. You know what? That's my fault that I assumed. Okay, so Scraven Base said, reason I asked, because I didn't want to just say, good morning, gentlemen, if there were ladies in the room. Well, you know what? I assumed wrongly of you, bro, and I'm sorry. Just being a gentleman. Yeah, no, definitely I'm going to say uh, there's probably none watching. Jimmy Dean asked, ever thought of doing carbon fiber? Oh, I'm almost also looking for a bit at the same time I'm talking to you guys. Okay. Um, ever think of doing carbon fiber, at least for speaker mount facing I've done some with small boxes that sound good. Um, nah, well, of course I've thought about it, but I, I would say my biggest limitation, man, is, is what the customers are going to be willing to pay for and what they actually want. Uh, I don't want to go doing, like, doing something that maybe no one's going to want to pay for in the end. Carbon fiber is expensive. I mean, expensive, expensive. Expensive, expensive, expensive. Alright, so I got my flush trim bit on here. Now, I don't know if any of you have this Bosch router. Um, and I don't know what it is, but dude, the, the base does not want to go on properly, like, ever. I had to actually grind away a lot of the inside tabs on this thing to get it to not completely seize up on me when I tried to take the base on or off. And I don't have like a ton of routers, so I have to switch them very frequently. All right, so that's set up good. We're gonna plug the router in.
Well, I guess I stand corrected. You said, actually, me and my wife watch most of the videos you have on YouTube together. She loves all your work. She actually, she's always telling me she can't wait to see how my box will be so beautiful. Hey, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I guess, I guess, uh, I guess my content is, will work for both people, I guess. I don't know. I guess my analytics are wrong. Uh, Jeremy Eaton asks, what's your go-to router bit brands? I got 12-volt tools and love them, but waiting on them to arrive sucks when in a pinch. Jimmy Dean said the uh, you can get a cheap bro. Whole box is like 200 bucks. Face would be like 50 bucks material. Hex weave is still high. Uh, that's in reference to the carbon fiber comments. Uh, and then John Ackers replied to uh, Ochen. Um, yeah, this box here is double baffled and window braced, but for his box, the ZV6 box that he's going to be getting, is definitely going to be triple baffled. I think that's just like a must when it comes to a sub that, that that's that heavy. I'm going to stop holding this damn router above my head. All right. Um, so, Jeremy, you asked what's your go-to router brand. I got, okay, so you said the 12-volt tools. Love them. Waiting on them. Sucks in a pinch. Um, personally, I have gotten 12-volt tool bits and nothing against them. It, I just, for the cost, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't amazed. I, I was, when I got them, I was really expecting to get them and be like, oh man, these bits are freaking amazing or, you know, whatever. But, uh, not that I wasn't happy with them. I just, it's a little lackluster. They're not, for the price, man, like the, I would almost say they're up there with the more expensive bits and I with personal use have not noticed that the cutting quality or quality in general is any better than other bits. Um, in a pinch or I mean even depending on what I need I will go with uh, Diablo Freud from Home Depot. You can get those bits at Home Depot almost any time. I do like their bits quite a bit they last a long time the uh i use their three quarter inch roundover that they have that thing lasted me a long time the only reason it really went out is because i like to router through nails so damn much not that i actually like to i just tend to router through nails all the time with especially with that big of a bit when you're nailing your pieces together and then taking off a roundover that's that large you will tend to cut through some nails for sure so um those are good brands uh, I've recently been using in like my flush trim bit that I just used or when you guys see me cutting out the window brace the other day That was a um, a white side quarter inch spiral flush trim bit which Is the first time I have ever used a quarter inch spiral flush trim bit I see I've seen a whole bunch of fabricators use them, but I also noticed they always tended to use them on uh, MDF and I kind of figured that with plywood you might have a little too much chatter to have the bit last you, but I kind of realized that uh, also they're just so damn sharp that the chatter is reduced like tenfold. It's it's the best bit I've ever bought for sure. White side, quarter inch, spiral bit, flush trim bit. It's amazing. And the thing it was like, I think it was 40 bucks, dude. And, and I want to say the 12 volt tool ones are probably in the $60 range. Yes, you do get to support a car audio company, and I, I do think that has value in itself, but I can also get the white side bits next day on Amazon, which you really can't beat, dude. You really can't beat that. And it kind of sucks that that's what it comes down to is speed of delivery, because I even know in my situation, like, I'm not, I'm by no means fast at delivering a product, especially when I do custom stuff. But you can order the white side stuff directly from Amazon. I've ordered at, four, like, I get to work early, uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I've ordered at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and received my router bit the same day at 11 p.m. 
I am in a conveniently cl uh, close location to the Amazon hub, and that's probably why it gets to me so fast, but, dude, you can't beat the quick shipping, and honestly, I will never go back from these white side bits. Somehow, I also got blessed, and uh, I ordered one bit, and they sent me three. Um, and, you know, I, I only ordered one, really, because I wasn't sure how I'd like them. I figured they'd honestly break, but, man, you guys seen me cutting the window brace yesterday in the part part one of this series, and I've also flush trimmed a ton of stuff, doing different stack fab stuff. This bit is a lifesaver. Um, the chip away is nicer. It's just so much easier on my router in general. I love the thing, for sure. I'm definitely happy all the way around with that bit. And, hey, they sent me... They sent me extra of them. I mean, probably on accident. And I did feel a little guilty that I got some bits for free, but I spent enough on Amazon. I think I ordered like 10 router bits that same day, so I guess I guess we'll call it good. We'll call it even. Thanks, Amazon. I really appreciated it. Hey, maybe they knew I was going to talk about them, dude. They just they sent me the bits because they knew I was going to up them so big. Yeah, I definitely go there. 12 volt tools. They make some good quality bits. I've used them and like them. You do get the bonus of supporting an actual car audio friendly brand, which, you know, you want to help the industry that you're in as much as you can, but I'm honestly too small to be able to afford paying even $10 extra for a router bit when, if it ain't going to make a difference for me. So. I do support them, and I think those guys are awesome. I'll recommend them to anybody. But personally, just for cost savings reasons, I'm going to go with probably what I can find off Amazon. You do have a ton of crap on Amazon, though, and you're for sure going to find that. Um, there's a whole bunch of cheap knockoff, um, you know, kind of crappy router bit brands on there. But you should be able to tell from the price alone that, that bit is probably not going to be all that great. I mean, they have like four four router bits in a set for $10. Like, you can't tell me that you thought that was going to be a, a high-quality router bit, you know? Okay. Hmm, let's see here. 418 Lightning, you said, but... You do need a vacuum pump and what other tools to do a job with carbon fiber. Yeah, I, I would say that the reason I'm not going to get into it is because I'll probably have one customer ever want it. Maybe maybe multiple after I actually do it. But at first, you're going to have a big investment for little to no return. And I'd rather just spend my time building other things and offering products that I know people are really going to uh, enjoy. Uh, John Ackers, what type of electrical would you suggest for 8K wanting to go lithium? Well, I'm going to automatically suggest the limitless, limitless lithium Cyber 12K for that. Dep I, I don't know exactly what amp you have. Maybe you have some like Boss 8K and maybe you don't need that much power. But if you have a decent 8K, I'll say go with the, go with the um, limit, limitless lithium Cyber 12K. They have a really small package. Like, the package size on them is really small. And for what they can do, the price is really nice as well. I don't really have much experience with a lot of the other brands, but I have done my done my own research and, you know, talked to a lot of people who have used lithium, and they like Limitless as well. I'm also a dealer if you want to buy something from me.
All right, so John Ackers originally asked what type of electrical would suggest for an AK, wanted to go lithium, and I did suggest the Cyber 12K. Then he did reply and let us know that it was actually a Synergy 8K. I'm not, I've heard good things about Synergy. I'm not too uh, versed in their brand and what they offer, but if it's going to do anywhere near 8K, I'd say go with the Cyber 12K. It's going to be a solid choice for what you want to run. As long as you're on normal, I guess there's more questions that you can answer to that also, though. What are you on 14.4 volts? You know, how many, what are you trying to charge at? Also, I would suggest definitely get a high output alternator, do the big three, um, and make sure you're running, you know, good quality OFC wire. Frank Johns commented, you asked, uh, would you consider building a six order for six 15 inch? Death Bounce DB 3015s for a Chevy Avalanche. Um, I don't know where you're going to fit that in the Chevy Avalanche. Um, would I consider building it? Yes, but uh, that sounds like a big build. I I've kind of made a rule for myself. Any wall builds that I take on, um, it's going to have probably a a minimum price tag of, of 10 grand and you're going to have to let me you're going to have to agree to let me keep the car for as long as it takes me up upwards of a year at least so just consider that i'm i'm definitely not a the cost effective version in the bed yeah i don't know if you're fitting i mean unless you're going to put a a camper you're going to put a camper shell on it or something like that just seems massive for an avalanche, especially because you're saying a six order. Um, six orders take up more room than a fourth, obviously. You know, six fifteens and a fourth order blow through, I definitely think is is more than possible. But doing six fifteens and a sixth order blow through, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Jimmy Dean, you said you should try to build some of those tall hi-fi head speakers. And sell them for thirty grand. Yeah, um, no, nah, I'm okay. I'll, I'll I'll work myself right out of a customer base trying to sell things like that. I've I've definitely considered getting into the home audio, but uh, you guys definitely keep me keep me working with all this car audio stuff. So, um, you know, won't be anytime soon. 418 Lightning, you said that's a fair deal, honestly. I'm pretty sure you're referring to the price tag of a wall build and the wait time. Yeah, man, it's just, there's so many hours in it. Honestly, 10K is probably on the cheap side. And that, again, that's just for labor, not including materials. You know, a build, a build like that, I don't have any more. I'm so busy. I unfortunately have to severely narrow down my, um, what I take in. And, you know, I really, if I'm going to build a wall build, I want to build a wall build. Or if I'm going to build any sort of big build, I keep saying wall build. I know you're talking about a blow through. Actually, you know what? Since you're talking about a blow through, you'd probably be, probably be a little cheaper. Again, though, it's, I don't think it's going to fit. Um, running four now in the bed with a bed cover. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I think six is going to be really cutting it close. But, I mean, what kind of bed cover do you have? Is it just like a flat tonneau cover, or do you have like a, a camper shell on that thing? If you run in a camper shell, you know, then we're talking. But you also, you know, you got to worry about how do you have it ported into the vehicle. Uh, 418 Lightning, my sixth in my F-150, I've spent like two years building, and I'm still not happy with how it looks. I need to spend another 10000 on wood to get closer to what I want. Yeah, man. It, the material alone is absolutely insane nowadays. That's going to be like a big factor as well when it comes to pricing things. All right. So I'm getting... Oh, geez. Take up and over here. I'm... Uh, getting my router bit on my router i'm going to use my chamfer bit around the whole thing it's like the large 45 bit
Yeah, you know, another another thing, too, when you're considering having someone do a big build, um, you know, if I was going to do a big build like that, I would need to make sure I can hook up everything and install everything. You know, also that kind of comes with the, with the rule that I'm, I only want to install certain materials. I only want to build with certain materials. You know, I'm not going to install cheap wire, crappy amps, um, you know, less than, you know, subpar electrical, stuff like that. So when you're doing a build, that's definitely a major project and, uh, and a big investment, honestly. Come on, line up already. There we go. I think it's being a real pain in the ass. If you guys are just tuning in, we're working on an enclosure for four scar ZVX eights right now. This is a part two of a multiple part series on this building project right here. In part one, we went over the curve port. We showed you guys, or I showed you guys a few little details um, on how to do the curve port and everything like that. Uh, Frank Johns, you said, would consider it. Um, yeah, man, let, I guess, let, let me know. Um, I, like I said, I'll definitely consider it, but send me an email. Maybe we could talk out some details. The only, the only crappy thing is I couldn't start it, um, probably until mid 2022, maybe even towards the end of it. I already have, uh. Three vehicles here I have to build. top done. I'm going to do a slightly smaller one around the sides of the enclosure. Thank you so much for tuning in, Ochen. I appreciate you, man. Hopefully I'm still saying that right. <laughs> like, I feel so stupid every time I try to pronounce your name. He probably wants more 418 Lightning. Probably everyone wants more. Every base head wants more base. All right, so I'm going to set this a little bit smaller. All right, right there. Let's see here. Where do I want to start? Uh, I guess I'll flip it over and do the bottom. Thanks, man. You have a good one. I appreciate you uh, tuning in. Thank you for ordering an enclosure. I'm excited to start on your build, dude. ZV615, definitely going to get you nice and loud. If you guys are just tuning in, we're working on an enclosure for four Scar Audio ZVX8s. Or I'm working on it, I guess you could say. Looking for a 160. Yeah, Frank Jones, you're looking for a 160? Um, possible for sure, depending on what kind of power you want to run. But also, I'm gonna say, 
I do not guarantee numbers. And if you wanted me to guarantee a 160, um, that cost that cost a lot of money. Promising a 160, unless the equipment is, you know, really, really good, it's hard to say. Even if the equipment is really good, it's still hard to promise something like that. Yeah, Frank Johns definitely sent me an email, man. Uh, Custom loads at yahoo.com. Make sure you put in the description of the email, you know, what you want to, you know, just a, a good description on the email. Make sure you add one. Um, inside the email, make sure you're as detailed as possible. Mention that we talked on live stream. That'll help too. Man, for a 4-8 box, this is pretty heavy. All right, guys, well... Here we are so far. We got the routing done. We got this thing built. We got our sub baffles cut out, flush mounts on there. We got some details routed in it. In part one of this, we did the curb. So if you guys want to see that portion of it, make sure you go check out part one. If you guys want to learn how to curb yourselves, make sure you go check out my YouTube channel where I have a two-part video series showing you guys how to curb different radiuses and kind of giving you guys tips and tricks on how to do this thing. This thing is definitely a really strong enclosure. Got a double baffle, flush mount for the woofers. Got the window bracing on the inside. We got 45s in the corner as well. The curve port definitely looking good on this thing. We got a lot more work to go. This thing's going to get a bed liner finish on the outside. We got some sanding, wood filling, all that good stuff still left. And then we're going to jump onto the bed liner. We're definitely going to break this down into another part or a third part of the series. So this is going to be it for this much. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching. If you've watched this far, make sure you comment 1728 down below. Let me know you've watched this far in the video, even after it's been live streamed, so I know you're actually viewing, or who of you that are viewing. Thank you guys so much. If you're on Facebook, make sure you like, follow the page, do all that good stuff. If you're on 
YouTube, make sure you like this video, subscribe, throw me a comment down below. I will see you guys on the next episode of Live in the Shop of Custom Lowe's. We're going to be doing part three of this thing. We're going to be back today, so stay tuned. Stay close to your phones. When you see that notification, make sure you tune in. I'll see you later.